Some people say Philemon, some people say Philemon. I think the most important thing is we find out who was this guy. He actually was an owner of a servant that we would call a slave nowadays. Because the servant didn't have a whole lot of choice. Can I leave my little clicker somewhere? Here it is, right here. And so um, Philemon had a servant named Onesimus. Onesimus ran away from Philemon. And when Onesimus ran away from Philemon, he ended up being where Paul was. And Paul says he was a prisoner of Christ, and he became a real help to Paul. But Paul was not the master of, Phi of uh, Onesimus. Paul was borrowing Onesimus' services so Paul had to send Onesimus back to Philemon. But he says, I'm not sending you back as a servant, but I'm sending you back as a brother in Christ. Because Onesimus had gotten converted and become a new creature in Christ. And now he was a brother to, to Paul, so he's saying to Philemon, who is a Christian and has a church at his house, I am sending you back a brother, not just a servant anymore. What a wonderful story. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we want to thank you so much that you've given us this letter to Philemon that has these encouraging words that you can help us to understand what are the good things that you have put in us in Christ Jesus. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So part of the scripture that is in the letter is this in the King James, that the communication of your faith may become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you, in Christ Jesus. In the Amplified Version it says, and I pray that the partition, participation in and sharing of your faith may produce and promote full recognition and appreciation and understanding and precise knowledge of every good thing that is ours in that is ours in our identification with Christ Jesus and unto his glory we are in Christ my question is am I a believer am I a believer are you a believer am I a believer well when we look at this um, scripture reading that we did here, whoops, I'm going the wrong way. I never know which way this thing goes. I should probably figure it out before I come up here and tell you about that. However, I just want to ask, how many people um, this week have actually thought about themselves and, and said, I just can't do anything right. I can't believe I, how much I, I'm just not able to do things right. I, I'm a mess up. Anybody, anybody out here think about that this week? Uh, you know, it would be almost impossible for any of us to say that we haven't had those kinds of thoughts because the old enemy does come in with those kinds of thoughts. In fact, in fact, some of the negative things that happen in our minds are the things that cause really bad mental health. And uh, when we have bad mental health, guess what? We're not really that much fun to be around. And in the thoughts that come, you know, I can't do it. I'm not worthy. I've got to be perfect. Nobody loves me. I'm not good enough. Somebody wrote a book that was called Good Enough or Enough. And how many people just feel like they're not enough? Not enough? God made us. I must, make, I must not make a mistake. That's perfectionism. Well, there does come a time, and the Bible does tell us, that we are supposed to examine ourselves and t test and evaluate our own selves to see whether we are holding to our faith and showing the proper fruits of it. We're supposed to test and prove ourselves. Do you not realize and know 
thoroughly by an ever-increasing experience, that Christ, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless you're counterfeits. If you're a counterfeit, then that, then that might not apply. But in 2 Peter, it also says, and we're reading from the Amplified, Therefore, believers, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing you. Be sure that your behavior reflects and confirms your relationship with God. If we have a relationship with God, does it affect our behavior? Yes. Amen. Be, and confirms your relationship with God. For by doing these things, actively developing these virtues, you will never stumble in your spiritual growth and will live a life that leads others away from sin. For in this way, entry into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, will be abundantly provided to you. Wow. So there comes a time that we're supposed to analyze, we're supposed to evaluate, we're supposed to take a good look at ourselves. But you know what? For the enemy, it's unto condemnation. And Romans 8 verse 1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those of us who are in Christ Jesus. So for the enemy, he wants us to be condemned and lose our motivation, lose our energy, lose all the things that would make us peaceful, energetic, thankful, hopeful, relaxed, calm, and even happy or joyful. Now don't forget that if we have fallen... If we've gone into a sin, we're supposed to be specific about that sin. And my little children, these things I write unto you, that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And what are we supposed to do in 1 John uh, 1, 9? Confess our sins, and for he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So I'm not saying you're going to skip over your sins. Please understand that. I want to make that very clear. There is a time for evaluation. There is a time for self-examination. But there is also a time to be a believer about what Jesus Christ says is in you. This is the Bible verse again. Now, I just want you to know that I know that I'm a rotten, no good, low down person in my flesh. I would be worse than the worst Nazi guard in the camp. I have nothing in me that's good. I deserve death. I deserve to be not only crucified for uh, my sins, but all the things I could think of to do. I know that about me. I don't know whether you know that about you, but I know that about me. And until we know that, who we could be in ourselves, we have no hope. It's at that point that we confess and say, well, if I could have that thought, it must be something that there's no good thing in me. But I'm not that person anymore. We're going to read some scriptures that are going to talk to us about that. Philemon 1.6 says that the sharing, this is the New King James, King James Version, used the word effective instead of effectual. So I think we're going to understand it. How many want your faith to be effective? You want to share your faith, and you want it to, to make a difference? You want it to be effective? Well, this is the letter that Paul's writing back to this slave owner, this master. He's saying that the sharing of your faith may become effective by the acknowledgement of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. Now, when we're in Christ, we are in a very special place. We are not. We are in Christ. When God looks at you and you're in Christ, who does he see? He sees Jesus. He sees the wounded one. He sees Jesus. He sees the risen Savior. And he sees the blood that was poured out for your sins and my sins. So being in Christ is what the Bible says we is our position. Do you believe it? Amen. Amen. Wake yourself up which is in you in Christ Jesus. Now I want you to also know, we just talked about the um, being filled with the Holy Spirit. We talked about the fruit of the Spirit, and I want to make it very clear. The Holy Spirit is a person, not a thing. It's not electricity. It's not some other kind of power. Because in the Bible, in Acts 15, 28, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit can think. He can speak in Acts 1, 16. He can be grieved. You can grieve the Holy Spirit in Ephesians 4, 30. 
and the Holy Spirit can decide in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 11. So when we're being filled with the Spirit, we are not being filled with power, electricity, or some kind of inanimate object. It is the personality of God come to dwell with us. Jesus said, I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. I will send my Holy Spirit. He said, it's advantage for you to come, for me to go away so that I can send the Comforter. So we need the Comforter. And the Holy Spirit has promised to lead us and guide us into all truth, to reprove us in righteousness and of sin and of judgment. And so we need the Holy Spirit. Amen? And it's through the power of the Holy Spirit that you put off your old self. What? You don't get to carry your old self around with you anymore? In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22 through 24, in the uh, English Standard Version, it says this. Can you read this with me out loud? I'm going to start in verse 5. Oops, that's the wrong thing. It, oh, yeah, I'm going to start in verse 22, and let's read it together. To put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life, and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God, in true righteousness and holiness. Created after the what? The likeness of God, in true righteousness and holiness. Put off your old what? Self. King James says, you're old man. I like this version because it really tells me what I'm thinking about. Put off your old self because that was former. That's your, that's your old life. And it had corrupt desires and deceitful <coughs> desires. But now we've got to be renewed in the spirit of our minds. And it's our work. The same way we put it one off, we've got to put on your new self. Created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Now Paul really gets on this because he has decided that this is so important. He's going to write it to the Colossians. In Colossians he says this. Please read it with me. Put to death therefore what is earthly in you. Sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness. Which is what? idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming in, and these two, you two once walked when you were living in them. If you were once walking in something, are you doing it now? Shouldn't be, but the point is that if you are a new creature in Christ, you have put on Christ, you are in Christ, you're asking to be filled with this Holy Spirit, you're receiving a new life. Are you a believer? Yes. Say, I'm a believer. I'm a believer. Do you believe you're in Christ? Yes. Now, verse 8 says, But now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Don't lie to one another. Seeing you have put off the old self with its practices, and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. This verse 10 says, put on your new nature and be renewed as you learn to know your creator and become like him. Are you ready to become like him? We're not going to have omniscience. We're not going to have omnipotence. We're not going to have whatever the other one is. Uh, omniscience? Omnipotence? Omnipresence? But we're going to be like him. Do you want to be like Jesus? Is that your prayer? Well, then we've got to put on the new nature. We've got to believe what God says about us. Here's another way that it says, and this was an interesting translation, for you have acquired new creation life. What do you think about that? You've acquired new creation life. How'd you get it? How did you get that new creation? Rebirth. Rebirth. You said that prayer to Jesus. You said, dear Lord, I, I am sick of the old life. I want a new life. I want a new start. I want a new heart. You might have been three. You might have been four. You might have been five. You might have been 12. You might have been 65. You might have been 85. But at some point along the line, you yielded your heart to Jesus and asked him, Lord Jesus, come in. Into my heart. Into my heart. You said that prayer. He came in and he is the creator of the new life. 
So you have acquired new creation life, and this was from the um, Passion tra Translation, which is continually being renewed. Somebody said, we hope so, we hope so. Well, it's continually being renewed into the likeness of the one who created you. And it's giving you a full revelation of God. Every day, as we are filled with the Holy Spirit, these fruits of the Spirit, which is the personality of God, the actual condition of being walking with Jesus, all those fruits of the Spirit, and I hope those children are going to look at their little wheel, and they're going to say, I want that gentleness, I want that love, I want that patience, I want that, I, I believe God's got that for me. Is Jesus living in my heart? Is the Holy Spirit promised that I can have this fruit? Yes or no? Yes. I don't know if, I, if you believe this or not, I can't tell you. <laughs> Colossians 3, verse 1 through 4 says, <laughs> If ye then have been raised with Christ... Now, these people weren't dead. They were, what? They were, they were baptized, yeah. They were baptized. If you've been raised with Christ, the resurrection of Jesus, we are partakers of his death, his burial, and his resurrection. And if we have that, we know that we have this new life. So if you have been raised with Christ, Seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above and not on things that are on the earth. So, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. You know, what? when Jesus went to Nicodemus, he said, you must be born again. And the translation is, you must be born from above. You've got to be born from above. But once we are going from above, we're not the same old people that we were before. We have a new, we are a new creation. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. We're talking about how do you, how are you in Christ? My, li my life is hidden with Christ in God. Is your life hidden with Christ in God? Is your old stuff all passed away and all things have become new? Are you a new creature in Christ? If you are, please say yes. 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 Wake yourself to the reality of this. I want to see it in your face. I want to hear it in your voice that you understand that you are a new creature in Christ. Because when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Amen. You know, I know that how many times I've heard the thing, uh, but by beholding, you may become changed. And usually, for me, I take it to the negative. It's like, oh, you know, if you keep watching those kinds of programs, you're going to start looking like those kind of programs. Because by beholding, you become changed. By beholding, you become changed. So, it's not all negative. Because by beholding, we can become changed. As the mind dwells upon Christ... The character is molded after the divine similitude. And the thoughts are pervaded with a sense of His goodness, His love. Weren't those two of the things that were the fruits of the Spirit? His goodness, His love. We contemplate His character. And thus, He is in all our thoughts. You know that thing about what would Jesus do? If that's not something that's constantly coming up in your mind, what would Jesus do? That saved me the other day from a really bad decision. A text I could have answered back differently, but after I said, what would Jesus do? I answered it differently. And I think it made a difference. Because if I had answered it the way I thought about doing it just on my own at first, it would not have worked out so well. You don't have anything that ever happens to you like that, I know, but... We contemplate His character and thus He is in all our thoughts. He is in all our thoughts. His love encloses us. This is a real thing. The real character of God, the real Holy Spirit wraps His love around us. He's pouring out, uh, the Bible says about the Holy Spirit, we, we pour out the love, it's going to overflow onto other people. Um, if we, now this, you know you've done this, but you shouldn't have. If we gaze even a moment upon the sun in its meridian glory, 
when we turn our eyes away, the image of the sun will appear in everything that we look upon. In fact, we had some spotlights up here that weren't that great for us because every time we looked at those spotlights, we turned around, we couldn't see any of y'all. Y'all were just dots. How much better looking at Christ and when you look away, you're still going to see Him. That's, what she's, that's what's being said here. And thus it is that when we behold Jesus, everything we look upon reflects His image. The Son of Righteousness. We cannot see anything else or talk of anything else. His image is imprinted upon the eye of the soul and affects every portion of our daily life. Softening and subduing our whole nature. If you're prickly, he's going to soften and subdue your whole nature. He's going to soften and subdue my whole nature because I'm a believer and you're believers. By, and this is the same thing. By beholding, we're conformed to the similitude, even the likeness of Christ. To all with whom we associate, we reflect the bright and cheerful beams of His righteousness. We have become what? Transformed. Say the word transformed. Transformed in character. For heart, soul, mind are irradiated by the reflection of Him who loved us and gave Himself for us. Yes, I was a dirty, filthy, wicked, thinking sinner. But I'm not anymore. I might do stuff that's wrong, but guess what? I don't want to. I am, I'm not the same as I was. And you're not the same as you were when you gave your heart to Christ. You may go out, some people may go out and try to do some of the same stuff, but they'll never feel good about it again the way they did before. That's the power of the Holy Spirit to keep us on track. And when we do fall, we do say, we are prickly, or we're whatever you want to call it, difficult with people. Guess what? Holy Spirit quick comes and we say, oh, I, I really, oh Lord, I'm so, oh, that was not good. I'm glad I didn't send that as a text, Lord. Okay, help me to take that back. Even if it's a thought, going by your head. And that's the way the Satan is going to try to tempt us. You know, something about somebody, mumbling about somebody, and when they leave the room, I don't know. You're sure glad nobody could understand the thoughts that you might have mumbled. But we don't have to have that. That is the old man. We are going to contemplate on Christ and to whom with and to all with whom we associate. We're going to reflect the bright and cheerful beams of his righteousness. You may not even know how much you make places where you go cheerful. I left a job once, I was working at the University of Toledo, I don't have to tell you all that, it was the boys' dorm uh, uh, food for the athletes. And uh, one time I had to fry like 450 livers. Uh, that was because they needed their protein. Have you tried frying liver? That's really... Anyway, you can have a, a sunshiny, sunshiny um, personality once you've done frying 450 livers. Um, or I had to wrap hot dogs with bacon and cheese. And that, that was before I was uh, uh, understanding even that. But that was a public university. And when I left the job to go do something else, you know what, they take hot dogs, slit it in the middle, put a little piece of cheese in, they take a piece of bacon, wrap it around, you put it in a fry, put it in the oven, bake it, it's called something, I don't know what it's called. But that was a... Pigs and blanket, that was something. You can do the same thing with vegan cheese, vegan bacon, and vegan hot dogs, and it's not bad. It's a pretty good little treat. What's the point is that when I left, they said, oh, you always brought some sunshine in with you when you came. And I thought, did I? I don't remember being so happy frying those livers, but, you know, I fried them. Um, but they, they said, you brought sunshine with you when you came. You're bringing sunshine with you wherever you come. You don't even know it. My dad used to say, you know what, kids? Your face is shine. Your face is shine with the Spirit of Jesus, and you don't even know it. When we spend time with Jesus, our faces will shine. And wherever we're going to go, we're going to reflect the bright and cheerful beams of His righteousness. Because we have become not just uh, tacking on onto an existing building, trying to make ourselves kind, trying to make ourselves gentle, trying to make ourselves more loving, trying to have more peace. We're not tacking on to the old structure. We've put down the old structure, condemned it to death, 
decided that it was no good and needed a new start. Amen? Amen. And then we're transformed. We're new creatures in Christ. And we are irradiated by the reflection of him who loved us and gave himself for us. Well, if he gave himself for us, that's really going to be Galatians 2, chapter 2 and verse um, 20. We're going to get to that. This is from this beautiful thing that she read, wrote, because she's inspired by the Holy Spirit, telling her what to write, showing her the nature of Christ. And for her, this is reality as well. This was the center of her life. Jesus Christ is everything to us, the first, the last, the best in everything. Jesus Christ, His Spirit, His character, colors everything. It is the warp and the woof. Some of you don't know what that is. If you have a texture, you have to have straight, straight, um, what do you call them, cord, uh, frets, and then you have to have, kind of go across like that. You got the warp and the woof. He's, he's everything, the very texture of our entire being. And the words of Christ are spirit and life. So if you're not reading the Bible, you're not getting the words of Christ, you're not getting the spirit and life. Because of that, we cannot then center our thoughts upon self. I can't, be, I can't get changed if I'm looking at myself and saying, I'm not patient, I'm not kind, I'm not, I'm not, and undo all those, all those uh, fruits of the Spirit. Because that's a lie. Do you, can you have the Holy Spirit living in you, yes or no? If the Holy Spirit is living in you, can you have the fruit of the Spirit? Yes or no? So we can't then focus our thoughts upon our fallen, baptized, buried self. That's, that's going to be counterproductive. counterproductive. In fact, it's going to prevent you from having the character of Christ. Focusing on what's wrong with me, what's wrong with you, what's wrong is not going to get me the character of Christ. And aren't we waiting for His return until we develop the character of Christ for Him to reflect to other people? So you're sinning when you do this. You're sinning when you focus on self. You're sinning when you put yourself down to yourself, in your mind, out loud, all the time, so that God cannot work this transformation. Because if you can't be filled with self, and you can't be filled with Christ. Your self has to be a new self that's in cooperation with Him. And there it is. We cannot then self center our thoughts upon self. It is no more we that live. You don't belong to yourself anymore. You've been bought with a price. You belong to God. It's Christ that lives in us, and He is the hope of glory. Self is dead, but Christ is a living Savior. Amen? Amen? If we keep our mind stayed upon Christ, He will come unto us. And these are beautiful verses, Hosea 6.3 and Malachi 4.2. He will come unto us as the rain, as the latter and former rain upon the earth. As the Son of Righteousness, He will rise upon us with healing in His wings. Please read this with me. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me, Galatians 2.20. If you're still living, you need to ask Christ to let you be crucified again. Because when you're crucified with Christ, you no longer live, but you let him live in you. And He will give us the Holy Spirit, which gives us the fruit, which means we're going to act like, talk like, believe like Him. We shall grow as the lily, revive as the corn. And by constantly replying, relying upon Christ as our personal Savior, we shall grow up into Him in all things who is our head. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Through the merits of Christ, through His righteousness, which by faith is imputed unto us, we, to, we are to attain to the perfection of Christian character. Now we're going to look at that. What kind of faith is it? Really quick. 
Our daily and hourly work is set forth in the words of the Apostle Paul. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Looking unto Jesus. Looking unto Jesus. You wonder why we're supposed to spend a quiet hour looking at the final days of Christ when he was smote on one cheek and he turned the other when they beat him.